Today, I'm going to talk about work I've done together with uh, Stephanie Gunter, who uh, was not able to come here. Um, so I can mention that Livermore is about 40 miles east of San Francisco, 60 kilometers or so. And this is what it looks like in the fall. <laughs> um, right. So this is a little background. So you, you guys probably know all of this. So uh, I'm going to talk about quantum optimal control because that's what this meeting is all about. So we are working on kind of the basement here of the software stack between the, the circuits and the actual uh, signals or pulses that are sent to the hardware. So I'm, I'm going to be in, in this box here. And uh, as you all know, you had some circuits, a bunch of single and two qubit gates, and each one of them uh, is realized by some microwave pulse, in this case for superconducting qubits, and they're sent to the hardware, and this is what the hardware looks when it's not cold, and then it's measured, and you get some uh, probability of, uh, of the result. So, um, what I'm going to focus on is if um, there is potential for using high performance computing to amalgamate all these little uh, unitary transformations into one big one and, and thus make it more efficient. So that's the, the basic idea of this talk. Uh, so, right. So these pulses they use for initialization, they can create uh, special entangled states, and you can also use them to do a ground state reset. And today I'm gonna focus on uh, realizing unitary gate. Uh, so our idea is um, to use this in compiler design to use uh, <clears throat> dedicated um, pulses to realize more complicated unitaries than just single and two qubit gates can also be used for Hamiltonian simulations for a dedicated pulse to realize this operation here. Uh, <clears throat> so most, I'd like to claim that most existing tools, they're very convenient. They run on your laptop and it's uh, usually written in, in Python or Julia or some convenient scripting language like that, but they're limited to small systems. They work great for single and two bit two qubit gates, and for example, this great method has been implemented, um, for example, in Q-tip, and it's very convenient, but it's hard to use these tools to do three and four and five qubit gates. Uh, the other thing that I will point out that it's not just because the exponential scaling of the, the quantum system that makes it hard, it's actually harder to solve the optimization problem when these gates get bigger. So to mitigate some of these issues, we have developed a code called Quandary uh, that is open source. And uh, it's uh, <clears throat> meant to be, it can be run on your laptop, but it can also be run on a supercomputer. Let's see now if this works. Okay, so this is like a motivator, a teaser. So we, we uh, tried to realize larger C0 gates. So the C2 knot is also known as the Toffoli gate. And you can go, we went, sorry, wrong button. Um, uh, the unitary uh, has this form. So it, it's one big diagonal block. And then uh, this essentially mean that you have more and more uh, controller and, and one final target. So if all these control qubits are uh, in the excited state, then you will do an X gate on the target. So if you do this uh, through a circuit, uh, an estimate here is on an IBM system that one, it uses uh, just do one C0 gate, takes about 300 nanoseconds. If you want to do it to four gate, when we wrote this, it needed six C0. It might be possible to do this in fewer than six right now. But you just add this up and you end up with a duration of about uh, 2100 nanoseconds. You go to four qubits, it's 63, and then 
five qubits is, is 10,000 now, so it's a 10 microseconds. And just because of, of this long duration, the error will be large because of decoherence in the system. So then um, if you do optimal control instead, and these are not really probably not the shortest durations you can get, but, but here's an example. We managed to get 200 nanoseconds for one C0 gate, but then the C4 gate, which is a five qubit gate, we can get in 15 100 nanoseconds instead of 10,000. So then uh, it's significantly more accurate. So this is like the motivation for uh, what we're going to talk about today. So just give you uh, some background of what, how we do this. So you, you all know this, uh, it's a gate. So you have a unitary target, we call it DG. And it's supposed to do this operation for all uh, initial conditions here in, in, uh, that is normalized. So it's an n-dimensional complex space. Uh, we uh, consider the case, the simplest case of when there is no um, decoherence somewhere and the state is um, governed by Schrodinger's equation. Here we've written that as a in matrix form. So U here is the unitary transformation that is evolved in, in this way. We start from the initial condition, and then um, we discretize the system, in our case with an implicit midpoint rule, which is a structure-preserving reversible time integrator. Uh, and we parallelize with uh, the message passing library over all the different initial conditions. So if you have 32 for a five cubic case, you have 32 uh, columns in this initial condition. So then you can run on 32 cores and it will complete essentially 32 times faster. It's what we call embarrassingly parallel. And the, the goal there is to minimize the gate infidelity as the simple form that you probably all know. And uh, the Hamiltonian here I can mention, it's a, it's a basic docking oscillator. It's just a Hamiltonian and coupled by the dipole dipole interactions. The control Hamiltonian I'll show on the next slide. Uh, the key here is that we parameterize this time dependence with this uh, control vector that I call alpha that has a much smaller dimension than the number of times. More, more details are, are given in these papers. Okay, so, so this is one thing that I think is a little different in our approach from uh, say great. Um, so here's our control Hamiltonian. So this is uh, this is where the control pulses sit. We have one control for each uh, qubit and it acts on the lowering operator and then there's a corresponding thing that acts on the <laughs> racing operator. So the magic kind of sits in this D, which is parameterized by alpha and it has the following form. It's a sum over carrier frequencies. Uh, and it's modulated by B spline basis function. So B spline, here it's a quadratic B spline. It has like built in smoothness. So as one continuous derivative everywhere. <clears throat> so you don't have to worry about any sudden changes and triggering uh, furious frequencies in your control function. So you give them the, what we optimize over here is the uh, coefficient in front of the beast line. So if you change these coefficients, then, then you can essentially get any kind of smooth function here if you have enough of the beast. If you add in the carry wave, it looks like so. So so the beast line, it gives the uh, envelope of, of this uh, pulse. And the other thing we do, uh, which you guys probably all know about, is that we we, we calculate these uh, carry frequencies by looking at for resonance in the system Hamiltonian. So for example, and they follow as differences in eigenvalues. So um, for example, the zero one transition is usually this frequency omega here. And then if you have two levels, sorry, if you have three levels, you go from the first to second uh, excited state, then you, you have this this frequency. And you can also do cross resonance 
with a different system by driving it at approximately the frequency of the other system with the coupling of two. Any questions about that? So, it's all clear so far. Okay. <clears throat> so when we do this, we, we follow the first discretized then optimized approach. So it's a little different from, from Kritov, I would say, that seems to optimize first and, and then discretize. Um, so this is um, what we do. And the idea here is that we compute the, the gradients with respect to the discretized form of Schrodinger's equation. So there is no additional error in, in that formulation. So as we've heard before, um, to, to evaluate the objective function, you just evolve the system to the terminal time. And then to compute the gradient, you store this uh, terminal uh, state and then evolve backwards to the adjoint equation. And now for Schrodinger's equation, you can actually re reverse it in time. So there is actually no need of storing intermediate results. You can compute them on the fly. So this is very efficient. And then by solving this adjoint, you compute all the components of the gradient in one go. And then usually for the optimizer, you give some box constraints. So the amplitude of, uh, of your control vector can't be arbitrarily large. Uh, and then we add a little thicken of regularizer to improve the convergence. So most of Quandary is written on top of a library called Petsy that came out of Argonne National Lab. It, it does um, linear algebra on parallel machines, basically, but it also connects to a library called Tau, which has many different optimizers built in. So this makes it convenient to switch different optimizations uh, between one of the many things they implemented in Tau. So basically what you have to do is you write an interface routine that given your control vector alpha, it calculates the objective and the gradient. And then the magic happens inside Tau and it gives you an update of your control vector. So it does that, the routine we use uses LBFGS so it approximates the inverse of the Hessian using, using L of these uh, previous gradients, as you probably many of you are familiar with. And then it it does uh, estimate this uh, line, the, the step length, to make sure that the convergence is monotone. So this is the, the basic method. And at this point, this parallelization really only applies over the columns in the initial condition. So if we are on a, on, on a two cubic gate and it's raining, there are four initial conditions. So then you can, this technique allows it to go essentially four times faster. Um, let's see now. So I, I'd like to claim again that <clears throat> This is what we call uh, a reduced space optimization technique. So by reduced space, uh, you essentially mean that you only play around with this control coefficients in the alpha vector, and you always satisfy Schrodinger's equation. So the solution is always feasible. And uh, now to evaluate how this works for larger gates, we, we consider these QFT gates. So for two, three, and four qubits. So for two qubits, you have a four by four unitary, it looks like so. And then for three, it's eight by eight, and for four qubits, it's 16 by 16. So there are, there are two things that conspire against you when you do this. Uh, the first thing is that the number of time steps goes up dramatically. And there are two things that happen when a, a, a larger gate usually needs longer duration to be, um, to be realized. And also the Hamiltonian gets stiffer, so you have to use a smaller time step. So in this case, uh, the number of time steps is more than an order of magnitude larger for the four qubit gate than it is for the two qubit. And then it turns out that the optimizer 
also has more trouble finding a good solution. And here is the, the convergence law in the log scale. So for a two cubic gate, it goes straight down into the basement, no problem. For the three cubic gate, it seems to go through a slight barren plateau before it drops. But the four cubic gate, it essentially spends 250 iterations making not much progress at all before it starts converging. Um, so this clearly indicates that there is a barren plateau here. And, and believe me, we tried many tricks to try to avoid this, but it's really pretty difficult to do that. So yeah, so this is uh, time to solution. So for a, a, a two cubic gate, we saw this uh, in 2.8 seconds. No, it's, yeah, it's 90 iterations. Yeah. So, yeah, well, well the, the number of time steps, it probably goes up here by a factor, of, I don't know, 12 or so. But the, the runtime here, before, because the, it needs more iterations, the, the runtime here is like over 10 minutes. Um, right. So, so my, it's hard to, when you have, hundreds of, of control parameters to know what the uh, optimization landscape looks like. But my mental picture is that it looks like this. It's like you're in the desert and you're looking for this one well where there's water. And you go around there, bouncing around until finally, hopefully, you find you're close enough so then you can drop it. But it's, it's, uh, seems to be very flat. Uh, okay, so so here's what I really wanted to spend the time talking about. So, so we have this, so just the fact that looking back here, look here at uh, the number of time steps. Oops, keep pressing the wrong, thing. sorry. Here, so, when we have uh, a four cubic gate, then the state is, is 16. <laughs> Complex numbers, so in, in real uh, arithmetic is 32 numbers. And the, so the, the whole state vector is 32 numbers, but the number of time steps is, is like almost 30,000. So it's a complete imbalance between what happens in time and what happens in space. So, um, what we tried to do here is to come up with a new optimization method or a new ish, or at least a, apply a recently invented method to this problem. And uh, the idea here is to, to go to what's called a full space method. We also optimize over the state. You split your time evolution here into window. So in this case, we have four windows and if you know what the initial state is at the beginning of each window, you can evolve it independently of all the other windows. So this, in this case, we can we can uh, use run these four windows on four different processors and uh, get a speed up of essentially four. But then, what's the catch? Then you have to also. So so this these these. Uh, for example, from initial guess, gets this state evolution that has jumps in it, so it's not feasible. So the, the trick here is to enforce continuity at the window boundary. So on, on top of the regular optimization problem, we have to impose uh, uh, equality constraint. So like so. So here I call S with a delta T, that's the propagator that goes from uh, this uh, T2 to T3. So as, as it gets here, it needs to agree with the starting point for the next one. Otherwise it's not feasible. So um, the other thing that can happen here, which is kind of interesting, is that the optimizer doesn't know any quantum physics. This might come as a surprise to you, but it doesn't really. So it knows the size of, of these matrices, but in general, it will not be a unitary matrix that is fixed out. 
because it, it uses these differences to compute the gradient and it might actually leave the, the space of unitary matrices. So you have to modify um, what your measure of the infidelity is. And uh, it's not hard to see that this comes out of uh, Cushy Schwartz inequality, that this W thing here, the norm of it, can be larger than one. So if you if you don't modify it this way, then this whole infidelity can go negative in an unbounded way. So that's the, the first ingredient. And the other one is to uh, impose the continuity. So we, we do that. And the simplest way of doing that is by adding a quadratic penalty term like this. So this is now what the optimizer needs to minimize. So the, the, the big plus here is that we get a significant speed up in execution time for evaluating the objective of this, this new objective and its gradient. And the hope here, right, if, you, if you imagine that the blue region here is the unitary matrices and, and uh, outside is like the more general complex valued M by M matrices that somehow you can cut the cross here and get to the final solution sooner. Instead of having to spend time bouncing around here in unitary. Um, so the first thing we'll look at is uh, how well this works uh, for computing the gradient. So now we have like another level of uh, opportunity for paralyzing the problem. So. This cartoon shows the case when you have a, a, a single qubit gate, so you have two initial conditions, and we split it in four windows. So here we run this case on eight processors, and they can they can evaluate the, uh, this uh, to evaluate uh, the discontinuity at the, the window boundaries. There need to be some communication. So you know, processor zero here needs to know what this W1 is. So W1 sits on processor one, and it can evaluate up to there, and then it needs to know what W2 is that it gets from the other. Um, but it turns out that this it can be done rather efficiently with uh, within the MPI library, and here we have a case with uh, from three to five qubits, actually. So this goes uh, one step higher than we have before. So if we start with a three qubit case, uh, we start with eight cores because there are eight initial conditions. And then we throw more and more windows on it. And when we get to 128 windows, we get a speed up of 78 times. So in this case, we run on 1024 cores. And you might wonder, where do I get 1024 cores? But it's not on my laptop. but if you're in a modern supercomputer, that might have 128 uh, cores per node. Uh, so it's it's a rather small job for, for one of the big machines. So the interesting thing here is that you get almost perfect speed up. And then eventually, there are so few time steps in each window that the communication cost uh, takes over. And then it doesn't go anywhere. But we see a significant speed up for all these different cases. And uh, the five cubic case we ran on 4,094. Let me know if you have any questions. Uh, so here's the rub then. <clears throat> How does this work for the, the overall optimization? Uh, so in the in the case for the small gates, so two qubits gates, the, the QFT4, it's a four by four unitary. Uh, it actually gives superlinear convergence in the beginning. Uh, here's for one window, two windows, four, uh, and then uh, eight, and maybe 12 here. So uh, here is a indication that we made a shortcut through this optimization landscape, but um, eventually it levels out. And the reason it levels out like this is because the current optimizer with this uh, sequential, sorry, this uh, quadratic 
penalty term as it starts using more and more iterations to convert. And it gets a little worse when we get to three qubits. Then we, we get good linear speed up in the number of windows when we get up to four and then eventually uh, four, eight, 16, uh, this might be uh, 24. We get seven times speed up. For the larger gate, it, it doesn't work as well right now and uh, we still get some speed up. So this is uh, the, the current issue with this method is that the simplest way of, of satisfying this continuity or, or making the solution feasible requires more iterations from the optimized. Um, so here's a typical optimization history. Uh, in this case, we have the uh, three qubit QFT. So there is still some kind of barren plateau here before um, the residual starts going down. Properly. There is also some parameters in this method that might be hard to to find. Um, and uh, the other thing is that once you chopped up the windows, you don't really know what the infidelity is anymore. You only know how it, how it is in the last window, but it doesn't. So what's more important is also, what is the jump in the state small enough between the adjacent windows? So you don't really know what the infidelity is until you're done, and then uh, you can roll out the whole uh, evolution in the class. So we're right now thinking about better optimization methods, and they mostly introduce Lagrange multipliers. They minimize this Lagrangian, and it usually looks like this. So here is the uh, equality constraint. We want this to equal that. And then and this is called a Lagrange multiplier, and there are various improved techniques like sequential product programming. There is also interior points method that uh, we're going to look at in the future. So that basically concludes my talk. So um, I would like to claim that if you want to do multi-qubit optimal control, you need uh, to use uh, a high-performance computing system. And then you can use the Condry code that is open source that we developed. Uh, and it seems to work really well for computing the uh, objective and the gradient at the moment. Um, but the reduced space uh, method is kind of limited to three to four qubit gates. Uh, the time parallel approach I told you about today has potential for, for further speed up, but um, we can get the gradient really fast, but then the optimizer needs to be better. Um, so we are we are thinking about implementing um, an iterative solver for for solving this system. It's called the KKT system, and uh, implement it in uh, parallel, hopefully. Unfortunately, the the methods that are built into Tau they they do not allow this right now. And in IP ops, you have to provide all these constraints point wise, and uh, also provide the gradient. All right. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you very much. So I think there was a question right here. Uh, so quick question. This is probably written in C++, right? Yes. OK. And there then is, I guess we have. There is a Python interface to it. Sure. Uh, and then I guess we have a lot of time, right? Because there's no other talk. OK, so I'm going to ask like a long question. <laughs> um, can you go back to where you introduced the, the, the time, um, like the slicing of the time somewhere in the middle? Here? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, can you explain this to me like I'm stupid kind of? So like, okay, so the problem you want to solve is you have, you want to, you have an initial gate which is the identity, you want to go to a target gate, right? This is sort of the fundamental. So you have a, a big time grid. Okay, so now what exactly, so what's the procedure for setting up the, as uh, so you split it up into any number of, of slices, and now you have to define an optimization problem for each slice, right? So how, how do you do it? sort of in like very simple high level okay. terms. So so now instead of before we only had alpha as optimization variable. So so now we have all these intermediate initial conditions right. as additional optimization. 
so we expanded we have a we have a larger space we optimize it okay but presumably so in that slice that is marked with the delta t so now you have a sub problem where kind of you want to optimize from w2 to w3 and you have to decide what your w2 and w3 is for that sub problem right so how do you how do you yeah. decide it like yeah. how do you set it up so, so initially what, what we do we start from a feasible solution so we randomize the alpha vector that gives the control function and we just evaluate and then in this evaluation so that that requires what we call a rollout from zero to, to capital t but when we get to t1 here we save what what we call w1 All right okay and then when we get here we save w2 and then w3 Right, so you do one initial propagation over the entire time grid, and you get the state at the at the boundary. Yeah. Okay. Then I have something to start with, and now I can use since I have W one, I can evolve here and see where I get, because this is a local operation, and then this difference here between W two and and essentially the solute S times W one, that is uh, the uh, discontinuity. And that enters into this term. So what's the target then? So W1 then, uh, starting at T1, W1 is the initial state. And okay. then if the target state can't be W2 because that's the state you got from the initial propagation, right? So what's what's the target then? So so here, the target is only here. Uh -huh. This is the final target. So oh, you do a backward where... propagation. And that gives you the target, I guess. Yeah, so, so in each okay. uh, sub, in each window, I do forward and then backward to get the gradient. So it's very similar. So do I understand, so do, do I understand correctly? You do the, the one propagation over the entire time grid. You store the states at the T boundaries in a forward propagation. And then you also do a backward propagation from the target state. And that gives you the, like the W2 target. Is that, is that right? Is that so how it the, works? the initial rollout only happens once. That's to set up initial conditions for, dub, for these Ws in the middle. And then, mm -hmm. From then on, you only do local operations. Yeah, I'm still trying to get, figure out what the initial and the target states are for the for each slice. So I guess the initial states is you you get them from the initial forward propagation, and then what's the target for the for one slice? So the, the target is to get this difference to be zero. Ah, ah, this is where this auxiliary function so, comes so, in. So it's this term here. Yeah. Feed in. So these okay. are, are all the jumps. I so see. Once, once you drive this to be zero, then you have a feasible solution and you solve uh, Schrodinger's. I see. And do you have to do that multiple times? Is it like a super iteration and then you you have to do it multiple times or you just do it once? like this? Once per iteration. So in each iteration, you have to evaluate what this is. That's the final infidelity. That is a local operation in the last window. And then all these things is uh, local operations in the intermediate window. Okay, I think that gives me an idea to sort of, yeah, yeah. okay. I think that's good enough for now. Okay. I had a question on your idea to take this shortcut through parameter space. Are you imposing your unitarily, unitarity constraint strictly, or could you maybe think about imposing it weakly in the beginning and then strengthening the weight, like increasing the weight for this constraint to yeah. facilitate this shortcut. Right, so so in order to make a shortcut, then the the uh, evolution will not be unitary here in the middle. So so we, we tried that. We have a projection that we played with so to kind of project down all these intermediate Ws onto unitary, the closest unitary matrix. That turns out to, uh, that seems to only um, slow down the convergence factor. But yeah, it's in the code. <laughs> okay, thank you.